Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Kim Beer. I'm the Director of Public Policy at the Christopher and Dina Reed Foundation. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, again, I'm Kim Beer, the Director of Public Policy, and I am thrilled to be hosting our second webinar in our three-part virtual advocacy series to discuss the challenges of finding accessible health care, learning about barriers, understanding legal rights, and ways to advocate for change. Um, in this, in this um, section, we'll be, there'll be a special focus on COVID-19 as we move into reopening across the country. And this particular webinar will also address preparedness and patient advocacy. If you were unable to join us for the first one uh, that was held last month, you can find it on the Re Foundation's YouTube, YouTube channel. And before I introduce um, Andres again, we're so thrilled to have him back, I would like to address a few housekeeping issues. In the audience chat box, my colleague will be posting a link to captioning, to access captioning, should you, should you need that. Uh, I will also ask her to also post the link to our YouTube channel, should you want to peruse our other webinars and um, videos that we have there, including the first video that we, uh, the first webinar that we did last month. And in that chat box, I'll also be monitoring questions, or if you have any concerns about, um, hearing or any any technology issues, please let us know there. And throughout the webinar, I'll be monitoring the questions at the bottom, and we'll do our best to answer them at the end. If it's appropriate during the webinar, I'll, inter I'll interrupt our speaker to ask the question. And as a, a final note, this will be 90 minutes long. Uh, again, so we're pleased to welcome back expert Mr. Andres Gallegos, Esquire, of Robin, Solomon, and Pat, Mr. Gallegos is a disability rights attorney who founded and leads the law firm's national disability rights practice. He has lived with paralysis for over 20 years and has been a lifelong advocate for persons with disabilities. Andres currently leads his firm's collaboration efforts with a number of healthcare systems, managed care organizations, national dental and retail health care providers to ensure that persons across all types of disabilities receive the equal opportunity to benefit from their services. He has written numerous articles for national and state professional health care and legal organizations on matters relating to the application of the Americans with Disability Act, or the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act. Andres is a highly sought lecturer on accessible health care and disability rights and has served as the keynote speaker for several national local conferences. Andres, thank you so much for joining us again. So uh, let's get started. Kim, thank you. And thank you to your colleagues there at the Reed Foundation for hosting this webinar. It's great to be with you to discuss this immensely important topic. As Kim mentioned, this is part two of a trilogy of webinars focusing on accessible healthcare for persons with paralysis 
and mobility disabilities. Last month, part one focused on accessible healthcare barriers and legal rights. This afternoon, we focus on advocacy strategies to address the accessible healthcare barriers we talked about last month and the pandemic, looking at its effect on persons with disabilities and advocacy strategies to address some of the issues that have surfaced adversely affecting our community. Part three is scheduled for September 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, led by the Reeve Foundation. That webinar will address how the Reeve Foundation will elevate accessible health care for persons with disabilities as a long-term advocacy priority, and will identify specific ways the community can share their stories and be involved in working towards solutions. Now, before I continue, I have to clarify that although I am a member of the National Council on Disability and an attorney with Robin Solomon and Pat Limited, the expression of opinion or views during this webinar is strictly mine and not those of the council or my law firm. And neither are they the opinions of our gracious host, the Reeve Foundation. Also, I have to disclaim that nothing I discuss here should be construed as being legal advice regarding any specific matter affecting any of the participants in this webinar. With that behind us, why are we here? As we discussed last month, our ability to obtain and maintain good health is critically important. It's the predicate to our ability to live, our ability to learn, and our ability to earn. However, accessible healthcare has been elusive. We're gonna start by exploring a patient advocacy strategy to address accessible healthcare barriers, a strategy that individuals and those who love them and care for them can implement, a strategy that will maximize your visits to your healthcare providers. Then we'll focus on COVID-19 and its effect upon persons with disabilities. We'll discuss advocacy strategies to address some of those issues that have surfaced adversely affecting us, our caregivers and families, strategies to enhance our preparedness for the lingering pandemic and those that may come afterward. And then to close out the webinar, we've reserved time to answer your questions. We hope there'll be many. The photographs you see here represent separate and distinct barriers that affect persons with paralysis and other mobility disabilities to obtain complete and thorough examination. Examinations equivalent to those received by persons without disabilities. And as we discussed in our first webinar, these barriers exist despite nearly five decades since the passage of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and now the three decades since the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The inability to achieve accessible health care has resulted in significant health care disparities for persons with disabilities as compared to those without. There's a significant body of literature, peer-reviewed studies, and a number of different professional journals that document that persons with disabilities are the largest underserved subpopulation in the United States. We have higher odds of having unmet medical, dental, and prescription medication needs than persons not disabled. We are more likely to develop preventable secondary conditions, undergo severe medical complications, and experience hospitalization. And as a community, we utilize the healthcare system for disease management instead of disease prevention. That's explained in part by the fact that we tend to avoid places that are not welcoming to us. And thus, we generally only seek medical attention when it's absolutely needed. And we don't seek dental care unless we absolutely must have it. In our last webinar, we reviewed the different categories of barriers to accessible healthcare, among them physical, attitudinal, and policy barriers. How do we get those barriers addressed? Approximately 10 years ago, we developed a patient advocacy strategy that we call Acting Bad, a strategy that requires that you view patient advocacy 
as a comprehensive three-phase approach, a strategy that requires you further view patient advocacy as a structured, organized approach. Now, I presented this strategy in person to just about every Center for Independent Living in my state of Illinois over the past six to seven years. I've conducted webinars for other Centers for Independent Living in Texas and in Massachusetts. We've also presented this advocacy strategy at national conferences. This is a tried and true approach to enhance your patient advocacy, whether for yourself, those you care for, or those you love. When designing this strategy, we tried to address what we saw as a persistent and chronic misunderstanding within our community. The difference between a problem and a complaint. We know when we're not given proper access to medical services. We know when we don't receive complete and thorough examination. And when that happens, we may come home and tell our spouse, our significant other or family what happened. We may share the results with our advocates at centers for independent living and others, and we may get mad for a while, but the overwhelming number of us do nothing more. That then raises the question, what is the difference between a problem and a complaint? It's often said that complaints beg to be heard, but problems beg to be solved. A bit of tough love here. The fact that accessibility barriers exist pervasively throughout the country at hospitals, doctor's offices, and dental clinics, and other places is due in part to the fact that for the past 30 years, we, as a community, we've done a lot of complaining, but very little problem solving. In my experience, both personally and professionally, healthcare systems, hospitals, doctors, and other medical professionals are conducting a cost-benefit analysis in their determination as to whether to comply with their federal non-discrimination mandates. That is, unless compelled to do so, they simply won't. And by complaining instead of problem solving, we have enabled them to get away with it. We have to do better, not just for ourselves, but for those who come behind us. Those who may have no voice and may not know what their legal rights are. Thus, acting bad is a problem-solving patient advocacy strategy, a strategy that requires that you view patient advocacy as a three-phase approach, an approach consisting of actions before the appointment, during the appointment, and after the appointment. And while we have fun with the acronym and the little devil with the pitchfork, as I hope you'll agree with me when we finish, that acting bad is actually good. The first phase of acting bad before the appointment, this is what I call the homework phase. The first step is to gather legal documents, foremost a living will and healthcare power of attorney. Now this presumes that you have a living will and a healthcare power of attorney. What are these documents and why are they important? Both a living will and a healthcare power of attorney allow you to choose someone to tr you trust to make certain medical choices on your behalf. You must be at least 18, year old, 18 years old to create either document, and you must be of sound mind. That means no one is allowed to coerce you into making a living will or a healthcare power of attorney. A healthcare power of attorney is a legal document, the specific requirements of which are specified by the laws of your state. In this document, you designate one person to make healthcare decisions for you if you become incapacitated. As long as you remain conscious and legally competent, you remain in control of decisions affecting your health and healthcare. As soon as you become incapacitated, the person you authorize in this document takes over the decision-making process, usually making decisions that are agreed upon 
and specified in this document. You're leaving a trusted person to be in charge of medical decisions should you be unable to do so. <clears throat> a living will is, a limit, is limited to deathbed concerns only. It's used to declare your desires to not have life-prolonging measures be taken if there's no hope of recovery. For example, in the event of brain death or terminal illness. This document is also subject to specific requirements of the laws of your state. It lets medical professionals know whether you want to be resuscitated, whether you want to be kept on life support, whether you want to die naturally. These decisions take effect only when you are incapacitated and unconscious, and only if there's no realistic medical hope of recovery. If you don't make these decisions known, it will be left to your loved ones to make the agonizing decision, or worse yet, to medical professionals or persons appointed by a court, persons who do not know you and may not have your best interests in mind. Can you have both a living will and healthcare power of attorney? The answer is yes. Since a living will will generally cover only very specific issues, like do not resuscitate, it may not deal with other important medical concerns that you may have. For example, some people may want to refuse dialysis or blood transfusion, and those sorts of concerns can be directly articulated in a healthcare power of attorney. Who should you choose to act as your agent under a healthcare power of attorney? Definitely someone that you trust. It's important that your agent acts on your behalf in accordance with your wishes. You'll likely want to sit down with your agent and spell out verbally what you'd like done in certain circumstances. This way, your agent will hear it directly from you and not be surprised when they're asked to make decisions on your behalf. Do you need to have these documents with you at all times? Well, you should keep a copy of each in your medical records if you have a regular relationship with a hospital. You don't have to bring those to you with you to every doctor's visit, but any visit to the hospital where there may be a chance of hospitalization, you definitely want to have them. The second step in before the appointment, again, homework. Research the specific procedure, examination, treatment, etc., that you need. Become an informed or better informed patient and ask questions when you see your doctor. There are a number of good public websites where you can conduct the research as you see here. However, a word of caution, you may scare yourself easily and over-worry thinking that you have a, sp a specific condition when you may not. Step three, if you're enrolled in a managed care health plan, you have a choice of who your providers are. Research a managed care directory that's online. You may also request a hard copy of that directory from your managed care organization. See if you can identify who's accepting new patients and whether they offer accessible services or have accessible facilities. See if you can identify what accessible services they offer. I have to warn you that chances are this is going to be a futile experience. The overwhelming number of managed care organizations fail to live up to their federal legal requirements to have detailed, specific information about the accessibility of their network providers. More often than not, you'll find the word accessible or handicap accessible or handicap with very little detail. It's astonishing to me how many managed care organizations are still using the term handicap to facilitate a search of their network directories. Worse yet, you'll see the universal wheelchair symbol and nothing more. However, on the rare chance that your managed care plan directory follows its legal requirements, compare providers' degree of accessibility to determine who is better suited for your specific needs. If your managed care plan's directory doesn't provide that information, or if you don't belong to a managed care plan, then research the hospital, the doctor's office, or facility directly on its website. 
Once you're on its website, see what you can find out about the doctor. See what you can find out about the facility. Is information provided on where the accessible entrance is? Is there a photograph of the building? Do you see a ramp? Do you see where accessible parking is? Search the term ADA, disability, and patient rights. If choosing between doctor's offices or hospitals, and one has on its website information responsive to your search under the ADA, disability, or patient rights, and those patient rights include specific rights to address you as a patient with a disability, and the other does not, that's critical to know when deciding between them. Do you see the one who's more welcoming to you or one that who's not? Conducting the search gives you a sense as to how disability friendly a hospital, doctor's office, dental clinic, and other providers and facilities are. Steps five and six. Know what you'll specifically need for your visit or appointment. Will I need assistance transferring? Will I need lift equipment? Do I need to be placed in a wheelchair accessible examination room? Will I need assistance getting dressed and undressed? If so, will I need extra time for my appointment? And you're doing this because you want to be able to identify and state specifically what your needs are at the time that you make your appointment. When you call to make your appointment, even if you search the provider directory of your managed care plan or you searched on your hospital or doctor's website, when you call to make your appointment, ask specific questions like those that you see here. Do not ask, are you accessible? Accessible by itself is vague. What you really want to know is, are you accessible for me? Meaning, for example, I am going to require a ramped entrance into your facility. I'm going to need to use a wheelchair accessible examination room. I'm going to need assistance transferring out of my wheelchair onto the examination table using the Hoyer lift, using a transfer board, etc. Be specific in your ask. Step seven and eight. Confirm that they have what you need. Note whom you're speaking with. That's important because you should call back three days before your appointment to make sure that they will have what you asked for and what they confirmed will be available for you. If there's confusion or they say that they don't have it or are not sure, remind them of whom you spoke with, when you spoke with them, and the conversation you had. Three weeks ago, when I made that appointment, I spoke with Robert your scheduling nurse, and he assured me that he will reserve the wheelchair accessible exam room and will have lift equipment for my appointment. Continuing before the appointment, if they don't have what you asked for, then ask to speak to that person whom you had the previous conversation with, the one to whom you made the request for accessibility. Depending on the results of that conversation, determine whether you want to keep or reschedule the appointment. If your request for specific things will not be available to you, insist they record in your medical records that what you asked for will not be available despite your request. You want to do that because oftentimes medical practices try to charge you if you reschedule appointments or cancel your appointment. If you determine that you want to cancel your appointment or reschedule it, make sure they understand the reason for you doing it is not simply out of desire, but out of necessity, to ensure that you're able to get a thorough and safe examination. Depending upon your location, if you're in a rural setting, there may be very limited options for you to obtain accessible healthcare. In addition, in instances where you do not have access to reliable public transportation or private transportation, your options may be limited as well. If that's the case, one of the growing healthcare delivery methods is the use of telehealth or telemedicine. As you see here, it's the ability to communicate with a physician, physician assistant, or any other healthcare provider 
for purposes of obtaining medical care through a video phone, computer, tablet, or television. It's the ability to see and communicate with your doctor remotely. While this can be an effective delivery method of physical therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral therapy, or effective mental health and wellness therapies and interventions, there are significant concerns that it may not be effective for persons with disabilities who have medical issues, medical complications, or illnesses that really need the interaction physically with a medical professional to help diagnose and treat. Moreover, if as a result of this telehealth session, it's determined that you need an antibiotic or other medication, the correct dosage of which is dependent upon accurate height and weight measurement, then what? Chances are there's no way to obtain an accurate weight measurement unless you have a wheelchair accessible weight scale at your home, or if you know what your specific height and weight is. Many managed care plans and many healthcare systems, particularly in the rural areas, provide for physician home visits or advanced practice nurses that can come home and see you at your place of residence. Again, depending on the reason for which you need medical treatment, that may or may not be effective. Now here are some resources to keep in mind to use in this first stage before the appointment. For example, if you have a service animal and you're told that you can't bring your service animal with you, then what we found to be effective and preemptive is to provide the healthcare provider with specific guidance from the Department of Justice on the use of service animals. The link here is to frequently ask questions about service animals from the Department of Justice. In it, there are specific questions and answers relating to the use of service animals in medical facilities. Likewise, if you have a doctor who does not have accessible facilities, that does not have accessible examination tables, lift equipment, wheelchair accessible weight skills, or that doesn't have safe means to effectively transfer you from your wheelchair onto an examination table, preemptively, you may want to provide them with the guide established by the Department of Justice in 2010. It's very succinct, but thorough and informative. It was prepared for the benefit of healthcare providers with illustrations on how to provide accessible healthcare for persons with mobility disabilities. More resources. In 2012, the Department of Justice Justice created its Barrier-Free Healthcare Initiative with the pronouncement of heightened enforcement actions against healthcare providers to comply with their federal non-discrimination mandates under the ADA. There, you'll find a number of settlements entered into with providers throughout the country. You see the link to that website here. Now, there are two very specific settlements in 2019 that relate to the removal of physical barriers and the requirement to have lift and transfer equipment. Again, as a preventive measure, if the hospital or healthcare facility that you're trying to get an appointment at balks at providing you with lift and transfer equipment or provides excuses for not being physically accessible, send them a copy of these settlement agreements. It may help in grabbing their attention. The second phase of acting bad during the appointment here, the focus is on feedback and open communication. You want to ensure as you're checking in that in fact they have what they specifically, what you specifically asked for three days before when you confirmed your appointment. Don't wait until you're back in the examination room. In many instances, individuals are taken to the back into the examination room. They may even obtain assistance getting changed into a gown only to find out that there's no one there to assist them to transfer out of their wheelchair onto the exam table. Or there's no lift equipment to safely do that. At that point, you're somewhat committed to stay there and receive whatever assistance they can provide. Ask before you go back into the exam room that they will have what you need. And if not, insist again on speaking to the person who assured you that they will have that and address it with them while you're there.
If you find out they don't have what you requested, again, determine whether you want to keep or reschedule the appointment. Either way, insist they record in your medical records that what you requested and what they assured you was not available. If in fact you do reschedule, insist they contact you to explain why your requested accommodation was not available. Request they provide you with assurance that it will be there the next time. Feedback is the breakfast of champions. You want to reinforce a positive practice and behavior, and you want to correct those that are not, even with your doctor, nurses, or other healthcare professionals. For example, if the way they physically lifted you onto the examination table and back onto your wheelchair was smooth and safe, let them know that. Let them know how appreciative you are of that fact and ask them to duplicate that time and time again if that's your desire. If, however, they lifted you when instead they should have used a Hoyer lift, let them know that as well. Be direct and be constructive. In providing feedback, tell them specifically what they did and how it affected you. Your staff physically lifted me when I was assured that you would have a Hoyer lift for me. I was scared throughout the process and my shoulders are now sore. I asked for a Hoyer lift, not only for my safety, but for the safety of your nurses that lifted me. That's unacceptable. Next time, please ensure that you have a Hoyer lift as we discussed. Conversely, that wheelchair accessible weight skill was incredibly helpful. I'm relieved because now I know my exact weight. I've gone years without knowing what that is. Thank you for making the arrangements to do that. I'd like to be weighed for all of my other visits as well. There's no need to shout. There's no need for profanity. There's no need to be angry, just specific and direct. The goal is to communicate your message effectively, meaning you want them to listen to understand, to behave similarly or differently the next time. It's hard to accomplish if you scream, and it's not accomplished if you swear at them. What do I mean by enable? That is the avoidance of the temptation to do for them what they are required to do by law. For instance, if you bring a family member or an assistant with you to the appointment, and you need to be transferred onto an examination table, allow the doctor staff to do so. If you're comfortable, they can do it safely or they have the equipment that you need. Otherwise, if you allow your family member or assistant to transfer you, when the doctor has a legal obligation to do so, you're making it easy for them, for the physician to avoid meeting his or her legal obligation. They will also just assume that you bring somebody next time to do it for you as well. Allow them to do what they're legally required to do. As I said before, the issues that you advocate for at your doctor's office, at your dentist's office, at a hospital, are not only issues that affect you, but affect other people like you. That said, advocate as best as you can while you're there, but don't let it get in the way of getting the medical treatment and services that you need. There are means by which to get those issues addressed if you can't get them addressed during your appointment, if you'll follow this patient out of advocacy strategy. The final step in the second phase of acting bad, before you leave, make sure you know who's in charge of receiving patient complaints. Get their contact information. You may want to ask for a Section 504 coordinator, coordinator under the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, or a civil rights coordinator. You'll need that information if you're going to problem solve, and that's the third phase of acting bad. After the appointment, here's where we problem solve. Here's where a healthcare appointment, after a healthcare appointment, we make the clear distinction between complaining and problem solving. Remember, complaints beg to be heard, problems beg to be solved. Follow up. If they didn't provide you what you requested, follow up. With whom? The doctor, the clinic, the hospital. The civil rights coordinator, the section 504 coordinator. 
with your managed care organization if you're a member of the managed care plan. Follow up. Make sure you follow up. Again, here you want to be very specific and very direct. Now, many healthcare systems, hospitals, and medical clinics have a formal complaint process where you can fill out an electronic form on their website. But if not, you can write a letter or you can send them an email with this information. You want to make sure that you retain a copy of whatever you send them for your own records. Now, two weeks in most instances is sufficient time for them to thoroughly investigate your complaint. But don't be surprised if they contact you in two weeks and say they need more time. And that's okay because at least you know at some level they're investigating your complaint. However, if they don't respond timely or if you don't like the response they provide, don't leave it there, take action. Again, we're looking to solve a problem. In the words of the late civil rights icon, Representative John Lewis, his advice to the country to address racial justice and equality are as applicable to our fight for civil rights. Get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Make some noise. You're not alone. Again, we're problem solving here. We're informing agencies and persons who can take action on your behalf about what occurred and how it has affected you. If you're enrolled in a managed care organization, address the issue with the managed care organization. They have a contractual and legal obligation to make sure their network of providers comply with all federal non-discrimination mandates. The same is true for health insurers and health plans. Centers for Independent Living can advocate on your behalf, and they often have relationships with hospitals, health systems, and managed care organizations servicing their areas. State protection and advocacy organizations are in every state. They are the governor-designated organization of lawyers that serve as protection and advocacy organization for persons with disabilities in that state, providing persons with disabilities legal assistance free of charge. Now, most states have human rights commissions where you're able to file discrimination complaints with. If you're going to file a complaint with the state's human rights commission, be mindful that you have a short deadline by which to do it. It's typically 180 days from the occurrence of the discriminatory act. But you need to check specifically what the requirements are with the Human Rights Commission in your state. On the slides at the end of the presentation, I have a link to sites where you can search for your Centers for Independent Living. There's also a link to search for your state protection and advocacy organization. More resources to take action like the timing for complaints filed with state human rights commissions. There's also strict guidelines for filing complaints with your respective attorney general's office. The Office of Civil Rights for Health and Human Services and the Civil Rights Division Disability Rights Section of the Department of Justice. Here, you have 180 days from the occurrence of the discriminatory event. These agencies are there to address your concerns of discrimination against healthcare providers. However, know that they're limited in resources and do not handle 100% of cases or complaints that are made. Then there's also disability rights attorneys. You should be aware that under the Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, those laws provide for fee shifting. Meaning, if you prevail in your claims, the hospital, doctor's office, et cetera, may be required to pay your attorney's fees and expenses. Therefore, you, they may be able to collect their attorney's fees and expenses from the defendant and therefore should not charge you. Now, that's not universal. Some disability rights attorneys do charge and some, and some don't. But find out those, find those who don't. Also, you need to be mindful that there's statutes of limitations in every state that specify the time frame by which you need to file a lawsuit if one will be filed. Those statutes of limitation generally follow the length of the statutes of limitation applicable to personal injuries. 
and that may vary from state to state. For example, in Illinois, where I practice, it's two years from the date that discrimination occurred. Be mindful of the time frame by which you have to file complaints in court. Now, what you're seeking to accomplish as you take action, as you problem solve, is foremost to get things changed, specifically to remove those barriers, to adopt accessible policies, to acquire accessible equipment, to adopt training to make sure that their staff know how to use that and how to comply with their legal federal non-discrimination mandates, how to be dis disability culturally competent. Ancillary to that, under the federal non-discrimination laws that we talked about in the first webinar, and as I just mentioned, you may be entitled to monetary damages. There's no specific formula for those monetary damages. They can range anywhere between $2,500, $10,000 or more, depending upon specific facts and circumstances. But there's no guarantee that you'll receive monetary damage. The law provides for it under Section 504, Section 1557, and under Title II, of the ADA, applicable to public entities, but the complexities involved in obtaining monetary damages are beyond the scope of our discussions here. Just be aware that while available, they're not guaranteed. Now, now that you know what's required in acting bad, I hope you'll agree with me that acting bad is in fact good. It's a tried and true Patient advocacy strategy. It's been used by numbers of people with disabilities and their family members to address their own healthcare advocacy. And we have tangible results. In instances where individuals were not able to get resolutions they were seeking on their own, we built upon their acting bad to help create systemic change. For example, when you look at the three phases of acting bad, once those are implemented and if you don't get results, These are just some of the things that we were able to accomplish. With the exception of Costco and Dental Works, these other actions were undertaken without having to file a lawsuit. In many instances, these actions were undertaken on behalf of two or three individuals with mobility disabilities who had enough and did as much as they could on their own to address the issues. Persons who, after getting some but not complete results after advocating for themselves, were able to create systemic change by viewing the accessibility issues confronted beyond issues just affecting them, but issues affecting others similarly situated. There's no limit on what we can do if we act together, and there's no shortage of issues to address an accessible healthcare advocacy. The infection of infectious virus of ableism accessible medical diagnostic equipment and furniture. How do we handle this? How do we address this? Strategize to include persons with disabilities on healthcare systems and hospitals boards. Appeal to hospitals for certain advisory boards of persons with disabilities from the community. Presentations or lectures at medical schools, dental schools, nursing schools, etc. in your area on disability cultural competency, accessible health care, disability rights, et cetera. Those are just some of the potential strategies to address the virus of ableism. With respect to accessible diagnostic equipment and furniture, consider massive petitions, testimonials from the disability community, and the necessity for accessible medical diagnostic equipment and, reg and furniture regulations. Recall that from our first webinar, I mentioned that the Department of Justice withdrew the regulations for accessible diagnostic medical equipment and furniture because it wanted time to study the necessity of those requirements. This is after the Access Board, the U.S. Access Board, spent years since 2010 developing standards. But until the Department of Justice issues those regulations, they are merely just suggestions for a healthcare complier for healthcare providers to comply with. Similarly, appeal to your state's governor, Department of Public Health, 
to require that their providers in their state utilize medical, accessible medical diagnostic equipment and furniture. Similarly, appear to appeal to your managed care organizations as well. Again, there's no shortage of issues. The lack of safe patient handling law. How do we get that addressed? As you see here. Safe patient, landry, safe patient handling laws, as you may recall, only exist in about 10 states. And they were passed not for our benefit, but for the benefit of healthcare workers. And so collaborate with your, your state's nurses association to lobby for passage of safe patient handling laws. And then get those pushed to broaden their scope to apply to physician offices as well. The ones that exist now mainly apply to hospitals and to nursing homes. Now we've examined accessible health care in general. Now let's, let's look at COVID-19 and its effect on persons with disabilities. In the middle of January, the United States had its first COVID-19 case in the state of Washington. Since then, as we know, COVID-19 has ripped through nursing homes, psychiatric hospitals, intermediate care facilities, and other, other congregate settings for people with disabilities. As of this past June, people living in these settings make up less than 1% of the U.S. population, but nearly 50% of COVID-19 deaths. These deaths are avoidable and far from inevitable. In many instances, it's as a direct result of the decades of indifference, decades of marginalization, decades of deadly discrimination, the entrenchment within, the health, within healthcare of the medical model of disability. It's been said that crisis doesn't build character, it reveals it. It's true when applied to an individual. It's true when applied to society. As a society, we reveal who we are in the midst of a crisis. As that pertains to us, persons with disabilities, I'm not comfortable with what I see, and hopefully you are as uncomfortable. We listened and we read in horror. Headlines from throughout the country, how COVID was affecting our community. How states were brazenly either developing or implementing discriminatory policies to determine who receives treatment, who doesn't receive treatment, who lives, who dies. Those are just some of the headlines. As states and hospitals plan for surges in COVID-19 cases, They've had to make difficult choices who received limited medical supplies and services. In many instances, states adopted crisis standards of care to help guide healthcare systems and healthcare providers on how to provide the greatest good for the greatest number, relying on various methods of classifying patients who may benefit from intervention. Those who should be excluded for a variety of reasons, some valid and some just patently discriminatory. In March and April, disability rights advocacy groups and persons with disabilities filed complaints with the Office of Civil Rights for Health and Human Services, alleging that guidelines put forth by Alabama, Kansas, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Utah, and Washington illegally discriminated against persons with disabilities. As reported by the Center for Public Integrity, in April, 25 states have policies that also have similar provisions. The crux of the complaints by disability rights advocates are policies that base triage decisions on quality of life judgments or exclude patients with specific conditions are discriminatory. For instance, Alabama's now rescinded guidelines call for hospitals to withhold ventilators from patients with severe or profound mental retardation. Utah's guidelines recommended excluding patients with advanced neuromuscular diseases, requiring assistance with activities of daily living. In Pennsylvania, the Department of Health issued guidelines that, are used, that use criteria to automatically deprioritize us based on the pre-existing conditions that are disabilities. The Office of Civil Rights for Health and Human Services 
was quick to intervene and get the states to reverse those policies. Its directive to states in general is whether an individual is a candidate for treatment should be based on an individual assessment of that patient, an assessment based on the base, best available objective medical evidence. Decisions about access to treatment must consider not whether someone has a disability, but rather the patient's prospects of benefiting from treatment. But it must be treatment for which they are seeking assistance. When persons with disabilities are admitted to a hospital for COVID, we are not there. We're there to get the virus treated. We are not there to be cured of our paralysis or other conditions that may be affecting us. Just today, the Office of Civil Rights announced the resolution of a federal complaint against Utah. The complaint alleged that the state's plan illegally excluded certain people with disabilities, as I mentioned, from accessing life-saving treatment like ventilators based solely on their disability and deprioritize others based on disabilities. Critically important, hospitals in Utah are now no, are precluded from imposing blanket do not resuscitate policies for reasons of resource constraint. Tremendous victory. Here are some of the other issues that surfaced in these discriminatory crisis standards of care. More issues. According to the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, crisis standards of care criteria must be clear enough that practitioners can apply them when making decisions at bedside. That's especially true when the stewarding of scarce resources means withholding or withdrawing critical care services. Those criteria must reflect the values, wishes, and interests of all patients, especially the most vulnerable. But as we know, that's not been the case. In March, in response to the complaints received, the Office of Civil Rights for Health and Human Services was compelled to issue a bulletin to all healthcare providers throughout the country, reminding them of the applicability of the federal non-discrimination mandates, mandates under Section 1557 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, mandates under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. The very next day, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division issued a similar statement reminding the healthcare providers of the applicability of civil rights laws, not only under the ADA, but also under the Civil Rights Act as well. It's absolutely clear, even in times of a pandemic, better put, especially in times of a pandemic, the federal non-discrimination mandates that protect us apply. They must be followed and they must be enforced. The pandemic response has been data-driven. Counts of the number of COVID-19 tests, infections, and mortality have been essential in shaping public health policies and response efforts. But for us, barriers to getting tested or accessing healthcare means that data from or about us are less likely to be included in surveillance estimates. This creates a bias in the overall COVID-19 data, and it can misguide response efforts. Tracking COVID-19 among persons with disabilities is also limited by the lack or inadequacy of data reported by states. The need for COVID-19 data mirrors calls for better data collection and reporting by race and ethnicity. As states have begun to release COVID-19 data by race, important disparities have been identified. State-level data have substantiated the need for more equitable pandemic response to reduce COVID-19 infection rates and improve outcomes for racial minorities. Without similar data by disability, we again become an afterthought. We are not designated as a minority group, and as a result, we are very often ignored or left out of studies relating to minority health. In addition, we are limited in our ability to get testing 
and to receive medical treatment and options in community and home settings. Alternative settings that are needed to avoid us from having to go either to hospitals, inundated with COVID, or to nursing homes. There are even more problems in the lack of immediate care and placement options for those who may be COVID positive, but who are not sick enough to be in a healthcare facility and cannot isolate in place. A lack of options for those of us experiencing disruption in care due to the erosion of personal assistance services and home care, and the lack of placement options for those of us who need to be isolated immediately as a caregiver is COVID positive or somebody in a congregate living facility is positive or suspected of being infected. Where do we go? More issues. We are equally affected by the shortage of personal protective equipment, not only for ourselves, but for our caregivers. A shortage that places us in grave risk. A shortage that precludes us from being able to safely interact with our caregivers. No visitors policies were enacted by virtually every hospital when pandemic hit. Unintentionally, I believe, those put us in even graver danger if we needed to be hospitalized as we were not permitted to have a family member, loved one, or aid with us to assist attending to our needs. In June, the Office of Civil Rights for Health and Human Services reached an early case resolution with the state of Connecticut. There, as a result of a complaint that alleged that without support persons, specific per patients with disabilities in Connecticut facilities were being denied equal access to medical treatment, effective communication, the ability to make informed decisions, and that they were being unnecessarily subjected to physical and pharmacological restraints. As part of the resolution, Connecticut issued an executive order to ensure that people with disabilities have reasonable access to support personnel in hospital settings in a manner that's consistent with disability rights law and the health and safety of patients, healthcare providers, and support persons. The order includes establishing a statewide policy requiring hospitals and other acute care settings to permit the entrance of a designated support person for a patient with a disability and permitting family members service providers, or other individuals knowledgeable about the needs of the patient to serve as a designated support person. Where patients with disability are in such a setting for longer than one day, they may designate two support persons, provided only one is present at a time. In addition, we're adversely affected by not being able to safely distance, maintaining six feet for our direct support workers, whether they be home health aides, personal care aides, or family caregivers, if our direct care workers are continuing to provide us care during this pandemic. As crisis reveals character, it also prevents, presents opportunities. Here, opportunities to advocate to ensure our rights and well-being are protected, respected, and valued. Here as well, there's no shortage of issues requiring advocacy. The infectious virus of ableism, again, the crisis standards of care. Candidly, it's difficult to address during the pandemic, but it's something that we must do when it eventually subsides. But when you see it, when you see the ableism, you have to call it out. For example, in June, when St. David South Austin Medical Center in Austin, Texas, denied Michael Hickson quadriplegic and with other disabilities care and treatment for his COVID because of a quality of life determination, Adaptive Texas and the broader dis disability community called it out demanding investigations and for persons to be held accountable. Adaptive Texas has been demanding a meeting with hospital administrators to address the underlying issues of implicit bias among, among their healthcare staff. Crisis standards of care. How do we get those addressed? You need to determine who the source is of those standards. Is it statewide? In which case it emanates from the State Department of Public Health, Health or the Governor's Office. 
is a country, countywide, in which case start with the county commissioner or the county health department. It could be a hospital or, a, or a health, center, health system specific. Once you find out who the source of the standard is, request to review a copy to determine if it's facially discriminatory. If it is, then gather allies and get it addressed. If the standards were developed by a governmental agency, and if not publicly available, you can make Freedom of Information Act requests for them. Also, petition to have persons with disabilities included in the review or creation of the standard. Remember, and here, it means the matter of life and death, nothing about us without us. Again, no shortage of issues to advocate for. The lack of data on how COVID is affecting persons with disability. To address this, we can support legislation that's pending in Congress. The bill here would require HHS to collect demographic data, including information about disabilities, about individuals' disabilities, on COVID-19 testing, treatment, and fatality rates. HHS will be required to provide a report to Congress within 60 days after public health emergency ends. The report will include the denial of treatment for pre-existing conditions, removal or denial of disability-related equipment, including ventilators and CPAP equipment, data on completion of do not necessitate, resuscitate orders, and identify barriers to obtaining accurate and timely data related to COVID-19 treatment. All public health surveillance programs are only as effective as individual states' abilities are to track and report data. Consider a letter campaign to your governor or state's Department of Public Health to ensure that your state data collection efforts include us persons with disabilities. Again, no shortage of issues. The use of living wills and healthcare powers attorneys is critical. While some individuals may have the ability to hire lawyers, most do not. Medical treatment options in the community and in home settings. Again, how do we get these addressed? Again, while some individuals have the ability to hire lawyers to assist them with these documents, the vast majority of people with disabilities do not. Therefore, consider recruiting law schools in your city, local bar associations, which are organizations of attorneys, to provide pro bono assistance to create these documents and educate the community on the use of living wills and healthcare powers of attorney. To address the lack of treatment options in the community and in-home settings, here's some thoughts on what we can do. Suggestions here promoted by a consortium of medical professionals and disability advocates here in Chicago. They include calling for the development of regionally designated centers for care for persons with disabilities, with disability competent staff and telehealth capacity. In addition, these regionally designated centers should have mobile integrated health practice capacity. Mobile integrated health practices are somewhat new. They're an interprofessional practice of medicine intended to serve a range of patients in out-of-care hospital settings by providing 24-7 needs based at home, integrated acute care, chronic care, and prevention services. This model has been pioneered with success to address the needs of the disability community by the Boston Commonwealth Care Alliance. The Boston Commonwealth Care Alliance is an integrated provider health plan dedicated to the care of seniors and adults with disabilities. Its mobile integrated health program partners with ambulance companies and trains community paramedics to assist its members with acute and subacute issues. When sent to a member's home, mobile integrated health paramedics assess each patient and administer treatment with the goal of avoiding an unnecessary emergency visit or hospital admission. This includes performing physical examinations conducting assessments, and providing medication administration when medically appropriate. Think of it as home health agency 
on steroids. Again, no shortage of issues. To find options of where persons with disabilities may go in the absence of hospital beds and to avoid having them go to nursing homes, what do we do? How do we handle a shortage of protection of personal protection equipment? To give us options of where to go, again, here in Chicago, there's a group that's, that's advocating to designate and convert hotel floors to care for persons with disabilities. Those floors should be staffed with a nurse, CNA, or PA services, appropriate supplies and equipment, network for telehealth or telemedicine support, which has the capacity and option to allow caregivers and staff to live in, allowing personal assistants and family caregivers for persons with disabilities to live in and to participate with their direct care. This is particularly important for elderly parents and caregivers who cannot provide hands-on physical care, but can direct care that's needed. To address shortage of PPE in your community, call on your city's mayor and Department of Public Health to prioritize access for PAs, family caregivers, home health workers, and those that work and reside in congregate settings. Lastly, to address no visitors policies, educate, educate, educate. Provide hospitals and healthcare systems administrators with a copy of the early case resolution entered into between the Department of Public Health, Office of Services, Office of Civil Rights, and the state of Connecticut to ensure that our rights to be accompanied are protected. In the next couple of pages, I have various resources that can be helpful if you undertake these advocacy issues. As I've stated, there's no shortage of issues to tackle. Here's a link to the OCR's press release regarding the early case resolution, as well as the state of Connecticut's executive order relating to the no visitor policy. For information on the mobile integrated health practice, here's a link to white paper discussing it and links to the Boston Commonwealth Care Alliance program. In addition, I've added a link to the Journal of American Medical Association's article on the extreme vulnerability of home care workers during COVID-19 pandemic, a call to action, which may be beneficial if you advocate for PPE for personal aid, family caregivers, and home care workers as well. Contact information. For Centers for Independent Living, here's the directory and the link where you can find more information. For each state's protection and advocacy organization. For the Office of Civil Rights, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, a link to their website and a link to their online complaint. To the U.S. Department of Justice, again, a link to its website and a link to its online complaint form. In closing, So much to do. We've covered a significant amount of information both in part one of the webinar and then here again this afternoon. These are serious issues, issues requiring us to treat as problems, problems that I hope you recognize can be solved, can be solved by your actions and our collective actions. As we just celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, I'm reminded that the disability rights movement that you see here, which led to the passage of our landmark civil rights legislation, was not the result of one person or just a handful of persons. It took the mobilization of the entire disability community. It's a reminder of what we can do when we act together. However, do not underestimate the power of one and what you can do not only for yourself, 
but those like you to advance the cause of accessible health care. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, I'm going to take a drink of water, and we'll open it up for questions. Andres, thank you so much. That was um, really extraordinary, and as you mentioned, a lot of information. We were getting some inquiries from attendees about getting the slides and getting access to this information, and um, as my colleagues have stated, we'll be sure to post this on our YouTube, and if you have any particular questions, um, about the slides, we can also send you them as well because we realize there are also links in here and understanding that some individuals um, may, need, uh, may, may need the slides to access the information. So we'll be sure to get you that as well. Um, it looks like that there aren't any questions. I do have one question, Andres, about the ACA coordinator. Um, and I apologize if you address this specifically, but I'm curious to know if every um, office is required to have one, and does that person often have another role in in a doctor's office? Kim, I'm sorry, did you say ADA coordinator? Uh, yes, I'm sorry, the ADA coordinator. Yeah, so uh, the short answer is no, and that is uh, not every hospital, not every healthcare system, not every doctor's office is required to have an ADA coordinator. Uh, if they are Title II entities, uh, and that is if there are hospitals, healthcare systems, clinics that are owned by the state, by the county, by city, other mis municipality, then yes, they're required specifically by the Title II ADA regulations to have an ADA coordinator, somebody who is responsible for ensuring that the facility complies with their federal non-discrimination mandates under the ADA, and that is the person usually designated to um, receive complaints and conduct investigations. Uh, in most instances, uh, except in very large healthcare systems, the individual who's designated as an ADA coordinator, and for that part, for as 504 coordinators under Section 504 Rehabilitation Act, um, they may have multiple roles. Uh, they may be uh, either the risk manager or work within the risk management department, or they may be uh, under patient uh, services or patient care department. It's going to vary from, from location to location. Now, while those facilities aren't required, if they're not owned by a public entity, they have the ADA coordinator. If, in fact, they receive federal financial assistance, um, and that is they participate in Medicare and Medicaid, uh, then they're required uh, to have a 504 coordinator to serve in that role. Um, but again, that's not, not for all uh, hospitals or doctor's offices uh, under Title III of the ADA. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, uh, we have one additional question. I just wanted to address something else. And then in the, in the final webinar that we'll be holding in September, uh, you know, there are a lot of issues in here, as Andres said, and my goal is to try to identify some that the Reed Foundation can really identify as ways and work together to accomplish some of, or at least work towards solving some of these problems. It may seem a little overwhelming and you're wondering, where should I start? And obviously, we encourage your personal advocacy and your individual experiences, but the Reed Foundation has an obligation to help coordinate these efforts on a larger on a larger scale. So that's what we'll be talking more in depth in September. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, an additional question that we have from an attendee is, in the last webinar, you highlighted Illinois as having effective standards and practices in hospitals and doctor's offices that take the unique needs of people with disabilities into account. Could we hear more about those standards again, and does, do you think they should be taken nationally? So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure that I, that I said that. I know that um, in a number of actions that we have been involved with, and through the advocacy of uh, Access Living in Metropolitan Chicago, which is uh, the Chicago Center for Independent Living, and through the uh, awareness uh, of uh, individuals in, in positions of leadership, 
um, we've ha we've been able to achieve change in policies and procedures in addressing with large healthcare systems to embrace fully uh, and meaningfully their obligations under the federal non-discrimination laws. Um, but each, but there's no uniform uh, procedures. Each each healthcare system and each hospital that we've worked with have adapted their own uh, procedures with our input. Um, so that so so there's nothing there's nothing uniform there. But but there should be national standards. There should be best practices that that can be adopted nationally um, by by any healthcare system. I mean, there's a lot of work to try to get that done. Remember, as you may recall, uh, when Section 1557, the Affordable Care Act, was adopted back in 2010, it called upon the Secretary of Health and Human Services to develop model curricula uh, for medical schools on, on, on what the requirements are under uh, Section 1557 and the other federal non-discrimination laws, but also on how to be disability culturally competent to introduce them to us, uh, and that wasn't done. And as a result of that, there's a number of different schools and healthcare professionals that are undertaking to try to develop uh, national standards for schools to, uh, to use. And that's the first step in making sure that they're educated on what our needs are and are sensitive uh, and care about what our needs are. So. That's right. Thank you very much for clarifying that. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about that specifically in, in our next webinar as well around the medical school curricula. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. I also wanted to add for anyone who's, who's still with us, if you have any specific questions, uh, we have an, a team of information specialists with the Reeve Foundation. Feel free to contact us directly. Uh, you can visit our website. You could submit a question or a quest, a phone call. Uh, directly through our, our website, our number is there as well. Up, oh, and I think we just posted it as well. So, I really thank you. Um, any last words, Andres? Uh, we really appreciate your time and your expertise. This has been um, extremely informative, and we're really looking forward to our third webinar and working and sure. working, continuing to work on these issues. Kim, uh, thank you. I, I just want to thank you and your colleagues. Um, for organizing these webinars and and for soon to be taking uh, lead on these issues um, that we're going to be talking about in uh, next month. So uh, there is one thing I, I also want to add. There's there's been a number of instances where uh, where individuals, as I'm presenting this information, particularly on on acting bad, um, that they're fearful of retaliation uh, from their healthcare provider. Uh, for speaking up and speaking out. Uh, and that's a horrible position to be in. Uh, th the problem is that once you do speak out, that no matter what happens, if they have to reschedule an appointment or any little thing, it could easily be misperceived as being retaliation. By law, healthcare providers are not to retaliate against you for filing a complaint uh, or speaking up and, and taking action. So I hope uh, that that doesn't dissuade anybody from using an acting bad strategy or addressing any of the advocacy issues that we discussed, um, but know that the law protects them in case there is in case there is retaliation. Thank you. Yep, and there are ways to um, report report that as well. So, and a lot of that information Correct. obviously was addressed in the in the webinar. So, well, I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. And please contact us if we can be of assistance. And again, Andres, thank you so much, and take care, every, everyone. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Thank you.